High Excellence presents Jewels from the Holy Quran, a series of lectures by Mufti Ismail ibn Musa Mink. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa bihi nasta'in wa nusalli wa nusallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all his followers May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us all we are very quickly approaching the last 10 nights of the month of Ramadan inshallah when we get to those evenings we should be in top form inshallah and we should all have a firm intention from now that we will spend much more time engaging in the acts of worship that we are meant to be engaging during the month of Ramadan, reading the Quran, engaging in salah during the evening and lots and lots of istighfar. Aisha radiallahu anha once asked what should be done during those evenings and she was told very clearly to recite the following dua. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'fu anna. O oh Allah, you are most forgiving, you love to forgive, so forgive us. And from this we learn that if one achieves forgiveness during the month of Ramadan, they have achieved something very great and grand. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. Last night we had spoken about the fact that in Surah An-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the punishment of those who have committed adultery. There are several clarifications that I'd like to make. The first is that in a country where the Islamic law is not being implemented and where there is no Sharia court, it is not up to the general public of the Muslims to execute those, the, the penal code that is set in the Quran. So let's get this straight. Only where the Sharia is being implemented and there is a court that adopts the Sharia and implements it, those are the only places where this punishment shall be executed. Otherwise, it is not up to me and you to decide, right? Someone has committed this crime. Let's pick them up and start whipping them. Na'udhu Billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all understanding. In environments such as the one we are living in, we will engage in tawbah inshallah and we will encourage others to engage in tawbah and we will try our best to communicate the good word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that people can turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their hearts. And may Allah use us inshallah to deliver the message and may he make us from amongst those who can adopt it ourselves as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the lashing. I mentioned yesterday the stoning. Today I'd like to mention the lashing, 80 lashes or up to 100 lashes of those, in fact 100 lashes, the adulterer or adulteress, those who have committed adultery and they have not been married in the past or they are not married a correct nikah at the moment as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of that. And as I said, and I'm repeating it again today, the, the punishment regarding those who've committed adultery in the Sharia, yes, it is a punishment. Whether it is the stoning to death of those who have been married or are married, or whether it is the whipping and lashing of those who have not been married. We must not deny that it is the penal code, but more than a punishment, we should all know that it is a deterrent. And I explained that yesterday. It is more a deterrent than anything else because it is absolutely impossible to have four solid Muslims of a sound background without a blemish on their record to come and witness one person committing zina. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that understanding. Up to now, the media makes a big noise about people who might be stoned here or there. The day they are stoned, we will tackle the issue. Up to today, none of them have been stoned. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to understand that the media has its game and it is playing it very well. But with ourselves, we do not authenticate before we believe it. So we fall into the trap of the media as Muslims ourselves. We tend to start feeling that the Sharia is barbaric. By doing that, we lose our own iman. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us all slaves of the media. We should not believe stories. When people utter, we should learn how they utter, what they utter, why they utter, and we shouldn't fall into their traps. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Then in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of a verse that is mistranslated in many of the English translation Qur'ans that we have. There is a verse where Allah speaks about 
The man and the woman who've committed adultery, and Allah says, "Azani la yankihu illa zaniyatan aw mushrikah, wa zaniyatu la yankihuha illa zanin aw mushrik." Now, what some people translate this verse as, they say, and I'm sure we might have heard it, they say that a person who's committed adultery will not marry anyone but a lady who's committed adultery. And a lady who's committed adultery will not marry anyone but a man who's committed adultery. That translation is incorrect. It's wrong. The word nikah in the sharia does not only mean the marriage that we engage in. No, it also means the act of intercourse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that an adulterer does not commit adultery with anyone but an adulteress because if she was not an adulteress, it would have been rape and not adultery. I hope we've understood that. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done is he is equating the two in the crime. Why in the previous verse he said lash both of them, not only the male, not only the female, lash both of them because they were both equal parties in fulfilling that crime. That is why Allah says, a person who is a male committing adultery is only committing adultery with a woman who's an adulteress. They are both equal. And if a woman is an adulteress, then the man committing the act with her is also an adulterer. They are both equal. So that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that look, a person committing adultery cannot say I committed adultery with someone who did not want to commit it because then it would be rape. And that punishment is far worse. But when it is adultery, both of them are equal parties. That is the meaning of the verse. In fact, some of the Sahaba have gone as far as translating it slightly differently also. And they've said, Azani la yambaghi lahu an yankiha illa zaniyatan aw mushrika. That a person who's committed adultery, it is not befitting for that person to then get married to a virgin. It is not befitting for that person. But it does not mean in any ways that a person who's committed adultery will never ever marry a virgin. That is a, an incorrect translation. We might have heard it. It's a point of clarification that I've made here tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the surah speaks about those who accuse fellow Muslims. And I remember mentioning that that is a bigger crime than zina itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they don't come with four witnesses, then lash them 80 lashes. Those who accuse innocent women, innocent mu'minat of zina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they don't come with four solid witnesses, then lash them for falsely accusing mu'mineen and mu'minat. Lash them 80 lashes and don't ever accept their witness in anything. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So it is very dangerous to accuse people of having committed adultery. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our offspring. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a very interesting ruling regarding a person who came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam known as Hilal ibn Umayyah radiallahu anhu. He came and he told the Prophet of Allah, Ya Allah, you said we should have four witnesses if we want to bear witness against someone committing zina. What if I've seen my own wife committing the act and I don't have the other witnesses? What do I do? If I come and bear witness, you, you might lash me. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam waited for revelation. Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam came and showed them the way out. If a man has witnessed his own wife committing the act and he, meaning he should then go up if he would like to if he would like to complain about it and bear witness against her and so on, and he would like her to be served the punishment, he should go to the Shari court or the Shari group and he should then tell them, bear witness four times, swearing by Allah that wallahi what he has seen is the truth. For each time he swears a qasam, it will be considered as one witness. The second witness, the third witness, the fourth witness, and then the fifth time he will say, may the curse of Allah be on me if I am lying. Then the punishment will be deserved by the lady. But because it was extraordinary, she will be given the opportunity to then also take a qasam, four qasams, that wallahi, I swear by Allah that he is lying. So if she takes one qasam, the first witness is thrown out. If she takes another qasam to say he is lying, wallahi, the second witness is thrown out, the third witness is thrown out, the fourth witness is thrown out. Now she will not be punished. In fact, she has to make the fifth statement to say, Wallahi, if he is truthful, may the anger of Allah be upon me. 
And in that case, the two will be separated forever and ever, never being able to get together in any nikah whatsoever. They will be separated forever. That talaq will automatically occur once there is that type of accusation that we've described moments ago. And thereafter, none of them will be punished. Obviously, the lady will not be punished because she also swore qasams that, look, it, it, he is lying. So this is how they shall be separated in the Sharia. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about an incident that occurred at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after a battle known as Ghazwatu Bani al-Mustaliq. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions were returning, with him was Aisha radiallahu anha. They were returning from this battle. And she happened to lose something of hers and she stopped to try and look for this piece of jewelry. And it so happened that by the time she got it, these people had all left and she found herself alone. She had been remained behind. She had remained behind and the army was gone. She was all alone. And after that, a certain Sahabi by the name of Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal radiallahu anhu, he happened to come by and he noticed that there is a lady. He looked at her and he recognized her to be Aisha radiallahu anha from the cover. And he addressed her with all respect. Obviously, she was the daughter of Abu Bakr, as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And we all know that she was the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the purest and most chaste women to exist. Allahu Akbar. She was one of our mothers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really grant us the union with her in Jannah as well. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this incident. But let me complete the incident. This man gave her a lift, literally. The man had given her a lift. And what had happened is that when they arrived in Medina, the hypocrites saw that this lady was on the camel of this man. So people like Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul and so on, they happened to accuse this woman and this man. You know, these two, they had an affair. Allahu Akbar. Didn't we mention that it is a very serious statement? You know, these two, they are committing adultery. They've committed the act. Look at them. And yet it was an innocent assistance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all understanding. So what had happened is, the news went to the ears of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was furious. But at the same time, he didn't clarify anything because had he clarified it and said, no, that's impossible. People would have said, look, he's only sticking up for his wife. It went to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He was furious. He too, he waited because had he clarified his daughter's name, they would have said he's sticking up for his daughter. And there was lots of turbulence and lots of rumors going around in Medina. The people fell into three groups. Those people who started spreading the rumors, those people who started the rumors and they were guilty of knowing that it's a lie but spreading it. Those were the hypocrites. And Allah mentions here, Allah says the one who, ha who was the father and the head of all this nonsense that was going on. So that is the first type of people, those who were cursed. The second type of people, Certain people said, no ways, we can't be dirtying our tongues with this type of, of with these type of words. It is definitely a lie. So without batting an eyelid, they immediately rejected the statement. Those were the second type of people. The third type of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there were certain type of people whom they asked one another, can we do it? If we can't do that, then Aisha is cleaner than us. Radiallahu anha, she will never have done it. So they too turned it away. And those people who had spread the rumor, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarified it almost a month later. Why a month later? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show everyone who were the culprits and criminals. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to cleanse the name of Aisha radiallahu anha from above. And those verses, we read them in salah and we read them in the Quran. When the verses came down after there was lots of turbulence, lots of turmoil, Allah says, those who came with that fabrication, the minute fabrication, the word fabrication was revealed, there was a sigh of relief in the whole of Medina. 
automatically everybody knew that this was a fabrication. They went to give good news to Aisha. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu stopped communicating with Aisha radiallahu anha. Because the rumors became so powerful, they were silenced. They were quiet, not uttering one word. You can't utter a word this way, you can't utter it that way. Imagine, they tried to accuse the most clean of women. So our women folk who may have been accused, do not despair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's not bad for you, it's good because they will take over all your sins. When you arrive on the day of Qiyamah, you will be spotless with other people shouldering other sins that you've committed solely because they spread rumors about you. If they could spread it about Aisha radiallahu anha, who are we? Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us several lessons. One is, we should not mess our own tongues with such statements about anyone. The other is, if anyone has uttered such statements about us, good news, it happened to the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was a sign of acceptance. Allah cleansed her name. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will purify our names, if not in the dunya, then in the akhirah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereafter speaks about Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. The one of his relatives was known as Mistah ibn Athatha radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu used to spend some money on him, he used to help him and so on financially. That Mistah ibn Athatha radiallahu anhu was one of those who was unfortunate and his tongue was messed. He started spreading the rumor also. Imagine about the daughter of the man who's helping you the most. So Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu swore a qasam. He said, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, I'm never going to give this man anything after this day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses addressing Abu Bakr and the lesson is for all of us. وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُولُو الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْيَعْفُوا وَالْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Allah says, those who have virtue and those whom we have given a comfortable life, they must not make qasams to say we are not going to spend on the poor, we are not going to spend on our relatives, we are not going to spend on those who have done good deeds such as hijrah in the past, but they must learn to find it in their hearts to forgive if they would like the forgiveness of Allah. Don't they want to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Definitely Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, when he heard this verse, immediately he compensated for that qasam that he had taken and he began to spend once again forgiving this man to say, no problem, everything is over. Those were the people. How many of us with our own family members, brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts, in-laws and outlaws, we are not ready to patch. Why? Here are the verses. Allah says, do you want to be forgiven? Then learn to forgive others. Because when Allah sees that you have a quality of mercy in you, He will show you that He has the greatest quality of mercy. So we want the mercy of Allah. Allah says, Allah tuhibbuna an yaghfir Allahu lakum. Don't you want Allah to have mercy on you? So forgive others, Allah will forgive you. May Allah make us from amongst those who find it in our hearts to forgive those who have wronged us in the biggest way. And inshallah, we who have wronged Allah day and night, Allah will definitely find the mercy to forgive us. Amen. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who like to spread gossip and tales, whether true or false, about immorality amongst the believers, for them is a severe punishment. <laughs> those who love to spread the tales of immorality between the believers, for them will be a severe punishment in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. Allah will disgrace them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. Do you know that when you talk about someone else, Allah will create someone who will talk about you. When you accuse someone, Allah will create someone to accuse you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. What goes around comes around. We've heard it a million times. Do we want to wait for it to be tried and tested in our lives before we realize that this is really true? It has been tried and tested in the past. It is here in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells that to us. So we should be good inshallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the believing males and the believing females. And he says, both must lower their gazes. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ruling about lowering the gaze is not only connected to one of the two sexes, it is connected to both. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereafter speaks about the beauty of women. And Allah says they must not expose it to anyone besides those whom they are allowed to do that to. And the list is in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to pick it up and to at least read it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the beauty of a woman being also in her shoes. Amazing. That is in the Quran. Women must not walk with such a sound of their feet and shoes in a manner that they attract the attention of strange men. Believe me, if you are to read the books that explain the points of attraction, they will tell you that the shoes and the noise that the shoes make you know, a long time ago, they had shoes called court shoes, court shoes. And I think they still exist. Those shoes with a long heel. When we were young, we used to think they are called court shoes because the noise they make is court, 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 court as the lady walks. May Allah protect us. That's on a lighter note, just to see that everyone is concentrating. Mashallah. So what it is, even with our shoes, we must remember we have a duty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must not be responsible for attracting those whom we are not supposed to be attracting. And when it comes to those we are supposed to be attracting, those who are our spouses, why do we find ourselves guilty of not doing that then? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really grant us the understanding and the ability to adopt His rules for definitely they will bring about happiness in our homes. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about His nur and his, He describes it so beautifully. Allah نور السماوات والأرض مثل نوره كمشكاة فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور الله أكبر I cannot translate that I won't do justice to it والله that is the نور of الله سبحانه وتعالى he says نور upon نور there is no ways we can describe that may Allah سبحانه وتعالى grant us the acceptance to see him in Jannah, inshallah. Because that is the biggest gift that anyone can have is to see their own creator. But not coincidentally, in the same surah, Allah describes the darkest point of darkness. In order to give us the comparison, when you want to show someone what is white, to compare it, you draw a black line there to say, look, that is as white as can be. Allahu Akbar. So Allah he wants to show us his light. He shows us what is the darkest creature of his. Where is the darkest point? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of a verse. And let's listen to it carefully because I'll tell you what they found in recent times. Allah says, describing the deeds of the kuffar, Allah says, إِذَا أَخْرَجَ يَدَهُ لَمْ يَكَدْ يَرَاهَا وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورًا فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ نُورٍ Allah says their deeds are like in the deep oceans. Those oceans where you have a wave above it, another wave moving in another direction. Above it you have a cloud. Now, they've, they have findings quite a long time ago, and I'm sure we all feel it because we are here in Cape Town near the oceans. They're in the deep seas, the deep oceans, you have a wave, and then you have an undercurrent in the other direction. So you think, mashallah, that this wave is going to bring you to shore, and yet it takes you further inside. I'm sure we've felt that those of us who might have been to the beach, including myself, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really accept us. We've seen this happening, and we understand it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it in the Quran. The two waves. Then Allah says, in that deep ocean, as meaning the further a person goes, he will find darkness on top of darkness. Moments ago, he spoke about nur on top of nur. Now he's speaking about darkness on top of darkness. A few decades ago, one of the universities in the United States did a research and they sent people in a submarine going down 
And as they went down, they began to write what happened as they went down. And one of the things was, at a certain point, the color red suddenly went black. It switched off. At a certain point, under the ocean. A certain meterage. I think it was about 200 meters down. Or maybe a little bit more or less. I'm not sure about the exact number. The color red switched off and everything that was red went black. Literally like someone told the color, you are no longer in existence. After some depth, the color orange went off. And after a depth, another color went off. Until there was a certain depth where all the colors switched off. Do you know in what order? The order of the prism. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. The other way around. All the colors disappeared. Until it got right to the end. When it got to the end, one of them actually stated, you know what, I can barely see my hand. I can barely see my hand. Obviously, then when they used that which was man-made, such as torches and so on, that was another issue. But when they came up, having written all their findings, they uttered their findings to someone, and one of them happened to be a Muslim and said, hang on, here's the Quran. It tells us that the darkest point is in the deepest depth of the oceans where you will find the colors, the darknesses one on top of the other. ظُلُمَاتٌ بَعْضُهَا فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ the darkness is one on top of the other. Here it is Allah is describing the colors that are being darkened one on top of the other. And then Allah says, If Allah does not want to give light to someone or something, it will never ever have light. Allahu Akbar. So this was a, a very, very interesting finding. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the miracle of that Quran, there were so many who accepted Islam. And as I said, there are so many things in the Quran that yet people will find out that this is all the truth. If you read about science and the Quran, inshallah, we might go into those topics sometime, someday. Or may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the acceptance to do that. It is so amazing how accurate the Quran is when it comes to these items. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about something very interesting after that. Speaking about the darkness, who are the darkest of the people? They are the ones whom Allah has described here in Surah An-Nur, whom, when they are Muslims, and then when they have a dispute amongst each other, and they are told, let's engage the Sharia to solve our problems. They say, they first look at whether they are going to gain from the Sharia or going to lose. Then suddenly, when they see that they are going to lose, they say, no ways, we are going to turn away. Allah describes these people. وَيَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالرَّسُولِ وَأَطَعْنَا ثُمَّ يَتَوَلَّى فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ مِّنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكٌ They say we believe in Allah, we believe in the Rasul and we have adopted deen, we are Muslims, then they turn away. وَإِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ إِذَا فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ When they are called to the judgment of the Sharia for their disputes, you find one group from amongst them turning away. Allah says, When they are gaining something from the same Sharia, they will be the first ones to say, let's go to the Sharia, let's go to the ulama, let's go and solve our problems. I hope we are not from amongst those. May Allah make us from amongst those who can surrender to His law and His command. Whether we are gaining or losing, we should realize we are actually winning in the eyes of Allah. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this in that particular surah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us all. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the surah tells us again. فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةً أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ those who go against the command of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which he has brought from Allah. Those who want to choose another law besides the Sharia to solve their problems, warn them of a severe punishment in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. May Allah not test us with those type of tests. Then in the next surah, which is Surah Al-Furqan, that is the surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala names it after the criterion, the ability to distinguish between good and bad, between right and wrong, between good people and bad people and so on. That is another name for the Quran as well. It is known as Al-Furqan because it distinguishes between the two. Allah speaks about a few items in that surah. Firstly, He speaks about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what the kuffar used to say. They used to say, why is he going to the marketplaces? And why is he eating food? He's a man like us. For what? Why 
لولا أنزل إليه ملك فيكون معه نذيرا Why is this messenger eating like us and why is he going to the marketplaces? Allah should have sent down an angel so that the angel could be with him or he should have had a garden and so on. At the end of that juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comforting him. Remember yesterday we spoke about how the other messengers were told the same thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِلَّا إِنَّهُمْ لَيَأْكُلُونَ الطَّعَامَ وَيَمْشُونَ فِي الْأَسْوَاقَ Every messenger we have sent before you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has been going to the marketplaces and has also been eating. So don't stress about what they are saying. They will continue uttering their words. You continue with your message. Don't worry about what they are saying. Don't be sidetracked. The same applies with us, inshallah. Whenever we are on a mission that we know is correct to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't worry about those who are laughing at us, those who make their statements. So long as we are focused, we will continue. The minute we become worry about, uh, worried about them, we will lose focus and we will be heading in another direction. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from amongst those. At the end of that surah, and I'd like everyone, in fact, I'd like to dish out a little bit of homework today, inshallah. I'd like everyone to go and pick up the Quran and read at the end of Surah Al-Furqan. Allah describes the true worshippers of Allah. Who are they? He calls them Ibadul Rahman, the worshippers of Allah. Do you know we made a sajda in salah? Just after that sajda, Allah describes the Ibadul Rahman, the worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, one might ask, why do we make these sujood in salah? Why are there some sajdas in the Quran? There are a few reasons for it. The first is where Allah has directly commanded the believers, O oh, you who believe, prostrate for Allah. So immediately we fall into prostration because we obey the command. The second is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about other creatures whom out of the greatness of Allah, they fell in prostration. When we read the verse, we are also one of the creatures. We'll also fall down in prostration. Those are two types of creatures. One, the previous messengers, the previous worshippers, how they worshipped Allah. They fell prostrate for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as soon as we hear these verses, we fall prostrate for him as well. And the third type of verses, when Allah describes those, like in tonight's verses, إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اسْجُدُوا لِلرَّحْمَانِ قَالُوا وَمَا الرَّحْمَانِ Those who refuse to prostrate when Allah's name is mentioned, when Allah talks about those who refuse, immediately after that we fall in prostration because we want to prove to Allah that, Ya Allah, we are not the ones who refuse. So these are the reasons why we fall in prostration. And that is why you hear generally the Imam goes, Allahu Akbar, and he goes straight into sujood. That is because one of these verses have passed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. After that, we completed one other surah known as Surah to shuara the surah of the poets. Poetry was on a very high level at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very eloquent Arabs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the surah describes the poets and he has categorized the poets. He says, the poets who follows them are those who are astray. But besides those poets who, are, who believe and do good deeds, they will use their poetry to serve the ummah. What this means is that poets like Abdullah ibn Rawaha, Hassan ibn Thabit, Ka'b ibn Malik, radiyallahu anhum jami'an. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted a poet guidance, that poet will use his poetry to call people towards deen. Like you hear the Islamic nasheeds and the Islamic songs where they are being called towards salah, towards goodness. That is serving this deen. But then you have people who use their ability of poetry to lead people astray, calling them towards haram, towards sin. In that case, who will follow them besides the sinners? That is what is mentioned at the end of the surah. That is why it is called surah to shuara And in that surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes also how the previous nations were treated and how when their messengers came to them, they turned against their messengers. And the message, I'm sure we heard it repeating itself in tonight's verses. كَذَّبَتْ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ الْمُرْسَلِينَ كَذَّبَتْ عَادٌ الْمُرْسَلِينَ كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ كَذَّبَتْ قَوْمُ لُوطٍ الْمُرْسَلِينَ كَذَّبَ أَصْحَابُ الْأَيْكَةِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ All these previous nations, how they belied their messengers. And Allah says, when their messengers told them, for example, at the time of Nuh, إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ نُوحٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ 
إِنِّي لَكُمْ رَسُولٌ أَمِينٌ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرٍ إِنْ أَجْرِيَ إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ All the messengers uttered the same thing. Look, why don't you follow this message? We are prophets. We don't want any money from you. We don't want any wealth from you. We are expecting nothing in return. We are just warning you. But they all belied. So Allah says at the end, we destroyed all of them. And that is why at the end of every segment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةً وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ Definitely in the destruction of that nation has been a sign. For who? For those who believe. But many of them don't believe. May Allah make us from amongst those who believe. And Allah says definitely, your Rabb is most powerful, most merciful. Why most powerful, most merciful? Because a person who can execute his anger and destroy someone and still forgives that one, that is true mercy. But when you forgive someone because you know that person is too big, you have to, you force to forgive them. If you don't say, I forgive you, they'll bash you up even more. In that case, that is an extracted forgiveness. It doesn't show your power and your clemency. But where you know there is a little child so, so... Uh, innocent and so small so young so vulnerable and you still say you know what no problem never mind carry on Allahu Akbar may Allah make us from amongst those who can have that quality in us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us on this eve and forgive us all wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad